So, um, welcome. Thank you for coming to the Shock, Humor, Farce, and Satire panel. Um, I have a slideshow. I'm going to warn you, there are some very um, violent, sexual, triggering images on the slideshow because of the work on here. I'm sure you all wouldn't be here if you weren't open to that, but I do want to warn everyone that, um, you know, there's some very uh, adult and shocking slides and images that you're going to see because this is, we're talking about shocking humor and farce and satire on the far side of uh, where comics can go. So we have four awesome uh, practitioners of the medium to discuss this topic. Um, first we have uh, Tommy Musturi from Finland um, joining us all the way from Finland. <laughs> and uh, then we have uh, Aaron Lang. Is it Lang? I'm sorry. You got it. I got it. All right. Uh, next we have Sabin Calder. Also, with Elizabeth Seam, uh, and finally Katie Frickus, who has a variety of um, publications. So I'm gonna, you haven't seen the slides actually, but I'm just, um, it's from the most recent work, so I'm just gonna, like, just to get things started, you can turn around and we'll talk about a little bit just about um, where you're coming from and what is going into what you're doing with uh, your work. So Tommy, I think you're up first. Yeah, this is Simply Samuel. This is a book, uh, it's available here at the show, right, a Fanographics. So this is your most recent work and um, it's a wordless comic. This is actually not, this is not from, this is, I put the slides out of order, but um, I don't know, what, tell us what Simply Samuel is. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, actually it's uh, like a second book in the series. Uh, I don't know how to define it. It's, it's kind of like um, I think most of my books they deal with like life in general. So, but I'm, I'm it's my first like uh, try out to make like totally new comics and uh, yeah. But uh, someone is is kind of like ghost like character. So I, I tr it's like a symbol for for that I try to draw like this average Joe from the street that nobody sees and nobody cares about. So at some point he might be really strong and at some, some point really weak, so. Mm -hmm. Do you consider it a farce or a satire? I mean, it's more kind of like this surrealism, actually, I'd say. I think it's kind of like a mashup of, of everything. Mm -hmm. So and usually I, I kind of like think, think that's like computer came from 80s, I'm, I'm that old, so um, yeah. So there's like, it's an episode comic, so it, the books consist of like short stories. So um, basically, I can start from scratch in every sto story. So actually, someone dies quite often. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is a lot of violent death. That does seem to be a recurring theme um, in a lot of this. And your, your previous book was The Book of Hope. And this is also kind of a slice of life comic, maybe. Yeah. I've said on the slide. Yeah, the same, same life life and death teams actually but it's uh, totally different from someone I was actually drawing this at the same time so I mean the book of hope it, uh, it takes place in my childhood locations in, on the Finnish countryside so but I'm, I'm in that I'm drawing like this uh, kind of like stereo stereotypic uh, like uh, image of a Finnish male and laughing at, at him, so <laughs> it's different. Yeah, it, it goes on through, we follow him through his life. Both these are really kind of long, like you say, they're kind of episodic, but we, we get to see a very full picture of all the, um, the mayhem. But, um, and this is just a drawing that I put up of your work that, just to kind of um, give an idea. So, um, Aaron, so your book, most recent, is Trim, which is an anthology. And, uh, and I mean, this is very traditional shock humor. <laughs> yes, so. Traditionalist. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it definitely goes back to, um, you know, underground comics um, and a very long tradition of this kind of material. I mean, what, what inspires you to make trim? What inspires, what inspires me to make trim? I don't know, I mean, really just my day-to-day -day experiences and my, my take on them. 
next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously you use, you know, offensive words. I mean, you don't hold back, right? I mean, or do you? I, I, it goes too far. I live in Philadelphia. I don't think the language I use is unusual. It's the language you'd hear on the subway, in a bar, in the fucking corner store. It's not, there's nothing really that exceptional about it. Why, why, you know, when did we all become children? I mean, like, pornography is a billion dollar business. Television's incredibly vulgar where there's R-rated movies and somehow people still think comic books are for children and they see a, a four-letter word and they're, they're very scandalized. It's, 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 it's very silly. Yeah, I mean, but I, I, I also, um, I mean, are you, I don't know, who wants to, oh, well, we'll come back to that, all right, we'll come back to it. But I, well, before Trim, you did a different book, though, right? That was called? I did a uh, porno series called uh, Romp prior to Trim. Um, okay. <laughs> and um, you've also done here available, now new at the show is um, huge. Uh, this is our favorite subject, of course. Um, uh, Donald Trump, which is probably something a lot of our panelists have dealt with, actually. So we'll come back to that. Um, and of course, you, I, I will say, uh, one of the things that makes your work really vivid and stand out is that you draw in this very, you know, beautiful traditional comic style. So it's kind of that. Thank you. Yes, but I mean that's also part of the shock humor of it, I think. <laughs> so, um, all right. Well, uh, Katie, uh, as <laughs> for a change of pace, as I was. Uh, putting this together, I often thought that maybe some of your characters were the opposite side of some of the strips that Aaron had done. Uh, like, Blabbermouth is, um, it's like friends who are writing back and forth, and like, it's told in like teenage diary comments. Is this a true story? Or? Yeah, Blabbermouth is a comic I did that's made of um, notes that were passed around in seventh grade. So I saved these notes for years. They've been in my closet. I pulled them out and I edited them down and I spliced them together and I changed everybody's name and a little story came out of it. So yeah, it's all true. Wow. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, tell us a little bit about your, your cartooning and your background and what, you know, what makes, what makes you want to do comics? Uh, uh, revenge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm really driven to just kind of let out everything that is inside of me. So there's sort of like a plumbing of the archives. I also am a library worker. So I'm interested in content that already exists that I can somehow riff on. If it's my own life, that's kind of fun because it shows a side of things that I wasn't thinking about as it was happening. But I do like, you know, gravitate towards the, the grotesque. So things like <laughs> politics and love, like to do political and autobiographical comics is like actually fits right in with that point of view. Yeah, I didn't actually put it on there, but wasn't the first issue of Barbara Mouth was about your own sexual history. Yeah, that was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, yeah, I was trying to just write every memory that I had ever had, and um, just as an exercise, and they were all sexual, and I was like, oh, this is fun. So I just decided to make all of them sexual and string it together. Yeah. Yeah. And why was it a mistake or an uh, accident? I was just really trying to be like, you know, let me go over my life and really examine what I'm doing here and then just write everything I could think of down. So yeah. they all slanted, I don't know. And then, yeah, I also like doing covers. So like, this is like a cover of like a 17, or no, a Vogue magazine from like 1983. This is an ad. <laughs> That's grotesque, you know, I love that. It's kind of sloppy. So that's my aesthetic, I would say. Uh, awesome. Um, I'll say it, Ben. So your book, um, Ignatz Award nominated, congratulations. Thank you. Um, uh, Maleficia. And uh, this is, uh, oh boy. All right, tell us about Maleficia. <laughs> um, it's 
about a lesbian separatist witch coven in the 60s. <laughs> That's my like elevator pitch. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, so this kind of starts out as, um, well, there's definitely a lot of violence, as you might expect from, and, you know, kind of playing with kind of horror tropes, I guess. Yeah. Um, the first one I wrote when I was really mad at someone. <laughs> I had this roommate who would not move out, and he wasn't paying rent. And so I just kind of, like, started venting, and then kind of turned it into a comic. Um, I love witches, and I don't know, it just went from there. Are you a big horror fan? Uh, yes, maybe. Yeah, I would say. There's also kind of this heavy metal aesthetic to it as well, um, and gruesome, gruesome stuff. I mean, do you, um, I mean, do you draw things to shock yourself, or to, you know, scare yourself, or to, I mean, obviously venting, you know, kill other people, cut off other people's Yeah, I, nothing I draw I really set out to shock anyone, or, I don't know, I just, I just love, like, telling stories like this, and, I mean, I guess if they shock people, then... I don't know. Yeah. I'm sorry, or, <laughs> or you're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I definitely, though, I will say um, the old I introduced the eyeball motif is another comics classic. Oh, yeah. yeah. I will say the last issue, though, got a little bit more talky, maybe. Yeah, that one I actually wrote out ahead of time, which I never do. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to write everything out and then illustrate it after I have a full script. And then the one I'm working on now, I'm doing the reverse, where I'm just drawing whatever I want and then trying to piece it together, so. Yeah, um, yeah well, it's, it's um, definitely come along. I have to go all the way back to the slideshow very quickly. So, um, but anyway, you've seen, I forgot to make it loop. I'm so bad at this. Um, anyway, well, now that we have an idea of where you all, all are coming from with all that, um, I mean, do you all, let me throw this open, do you all consider your work funny? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of be funny. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if mine is necessarily funny, but when you're drawing comics, you're spending so much time alone with yourself, and I feel like you just end up working stuff in that just to amuse yourself, so. I mean, do you consider, uh, I'll just throw this out, I mean, do you consider yourself, like, the, the main, like, I mean, do you know when the joke lands, let's put it that way? Like, you use yourself as the, as the um, test subject, I guess? <laughs> The jokes are always landing. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you just have to pick one. I think it's like pick the right one, you know, like try to keep notes, like what is going on kind of from ordinary life. There's so much funny stuff, you know, so. Yeah. Well, I, the reason I asked that is actually last night in the, in the reception, I was, we were having, a, I was having a discussion with um, another human cartoonist who's really nameless, and he was talking about how he knows when a joke has landed, and I was saying, but, you know, I mean, sometimes even with the greatest comedians, you know, you'll talk to them and say, oh, I thought that joke was going to slay, and then they tell it, and it falls flat, you know, so, I mean, I guess yeah. it's kind of like, you know, how do you interact with your audience for that? Oh, you never know. You never know how somebody's going to react to something. And actually, that's one of the great things now is we have like Instagram and Facebook and stuff, and you can just put stuff up and like, it's almost like market testing. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes I'll write something that I think is like really like I'm like my heart is like bleeding. I'm like, oh, it's so awful. It feels bad. I'm doing it, and then I put it out, and people are like, this is great. It's really funny, you know. And so. It, I mean, that kind of does help, though, just, like, to laugh at yourself, so. Yeah. But that's unexpected, a lot. <laughs> Tommy, what about you? Do you get, like, you know, people not getting it, or? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I get really, really feedback. But, uh, uh, actually, I don't really, I mean, I like comics that end in the middle, so I don't really care if the joke lands. But, uh, uh, and quite often, in the comic story, I take, take away the last panel, just like confuse people. 
<laughs> um, Aaron, what do you, you know? I mean, I don't really care if it lands or not. I, I think it's funny. I'll, I'll do it. And uh, ideally, there's, it's not just a joke, and it's about something else. So even if it's not funny, there's still something else interesting underneath it. And I mean, I will say, in, you know, your work obviously has a lot of what some people consider shocking, but I mean, there's a lot of levels to it as well. So, right, I, you know, I think it's important to remember that uh, comic books are stupid and lowbrow and entertaining, and you should deliver on that level immediately. And if you have something else more, that's great if people are willing to look for it. But if some people don't and they're looking for the superficial entertainment value, you know, that comes first. Yeah. So who are some of uh, your comics idols? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, pretty nothing, nothing exotic. The heavy hitters, you know, Robert Crumb, Dan Klaus. Uh, I take certain uh, aesthetic inspiration from uh, old mainstream comics like uh, Jim Steranko's layouts and uh, things like that. There's all sorts of formal elements to be found in many, you know, very bad, stupid comics that did some good things formally. Anybody else? Tell me, what do you, what do you, uh, who inspires you? Uh, I think it's pretty much the same as, as well, that inspires our own, but uh, from Europe there's like, uh, I don't know if you know this French couple, Rupert de Moreau, there's one book out in the States, uh, I think it's Back Full of Monkeys, mm -hmm. and they do like really, really dark humor. It's, it's mostly even not like funny. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like the idea. Yeah. Yeah. So they kind of like trying to find the border of what funniness ends. So. How about you guys? Yeah, I'm interested more in um, uh, like queer cartoonists, um, like cartoonists, underground cartoonists. So people like uh, Jennifer Camper, Lee Mars, kind of like the. Um, confessional cartoonists who were big in the 60s and 70s and kind of countering that whole, um, you know, R. Crumb, like, worship scene. And also, Aileen Kominsky Crumb is a huge idol of mine. Um, yeah. Um, I guess, obviously, like, horror movies, I love. That's a huge influence. Um, and horror comics, there's a lot of Japanese horror comics that I love, and um, like old DC comics. Um, I really like, there's a old mainstream comic called Doom Control, <laughs> and the guy that drew, first drew it, Bruno Premiati, I think is how you say his name, I love his artwork. Like if I could draw like him, I would be so happy. Um, it's like weirdly stiff and fluid at the same time, and um, yeah. Um, yeah, well, there's a, you know, a very strong tradition for, like I said, a lot of this stuff. Um, now, several of you have dealt very directly with the, I guess, you know, you're supposed to put a dollar in the tip jar every time you say his name, but with the, the President Trump era. So, uh, do you think that's made it harder or easier to do comics, to make funny, shocking comics? To, to, do sat, to do satire? Yeah. I, mean, I, I think it has in, in any medium. You know, these, some of these uh, uh, Stephen Colbert types or whatever, they all think he's great for business. But, you know, they're, you know, they're just scratching the surface. They're not really uh, lifting the veil on the disease of this country. And uh, things are so absurd and uh, it's beyond absurd. It's like, uh, how, do you, how do you satirize something so uh, just outrageous? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good time, actually, I think, to do literal work, like what is real, what is happening, what is close up, like what seems true, you know, because I just think that, you know, Donald Trump is, gives a sense that we're on a movie set in a way, you know, like I was at the Republican National Convention with a bunch of cartoonists protesting and there was no way to even get close to the convention center. It was on lockdown. There was like an already enforced sense that things were going to be done behind closed doors, like a sense of alienation. There were people supporting Trump, but they were all separate from each other. There was no 
camaraderie, you know, it was just kind of like a strange, people just <laughs> shuffling around, you know, it was like a burlesque, but like without the humor, and like, it's not funny, so, um, yeah, it's a great time to do comics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, sometimes it seems like we're living in idiocracy. I mean, I know a lot of people have said that, but I mean, things are just so bizarre, you know? Well, it's all what, well, what we're seeing is a very fascinating and strange role reversal where the left has become incredibly sincere and literal-minded, and the alt-right is using weapons traditionally reserved to the left, such as sarcasm, irony, satire, and humor. Some of the methodology of the alt-right is like the yippies and hippies of the 60s, like Paul Krasner's realist and whatnot. And how, how did we let the alt-right steal our tools is what I'd like to know. And how do we steal them back? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, it is. It, it is like. Um, I mean, quite, I mean, quite literally, with the Pepe the Frog, I mean, this is something topical to the people here. They, they are stealing our tools. <laughs> yeah, I, it, yeah, it's very sad. I mean, how do we fight back? How do we fight back again? I mean, I'm not saying fight back in a political way. I don't know if people might be in a different, but I'm just saying, you know, how do we fight back? I mean, let's all agree that Nazis are pretty horrible, so, and white supremacy is awful. So, I mean, you know, how do we fight back against the normalization of that? Do you think that, you know, how can humor be an effective tool for that? Well, we need to declare that irony is dead. You know, we went through a long period of, like, Irony being the hipster thing, you know, wearing the band t-shirt, you don't know who the band is, like, I, you know, irony is like this implication, like, that I, that I like what I don't like, you know, and I'm just mentioning this because recently what I've been hearing is people saying, oh, it is what it is, it is what it is, you know, and it's like, that's basically the opposite of irony, you know, because irony is like it is what it isn't, you know, it's like, we do need to face reality, like, this is happening, like, Donald Trump could be elected again in four years, like, a lot of people who support Donald Trump have their own reasons for it, and they still continue to support him, and everything is so wishy-washy, I mean, we just need to accept what is happening, and, and I think that's the first step. Acceptance is the first step. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I mean, Tommy, your work is is apolitical. I mean, this the, these two books are kind of apolitical, I'd say, maybe you know. But I mean, you are involved with some other stuff. You know, some publishing companies that attack more topical yeah, material. Well, well uh, it used to be a publisher. We actually quit our house like last December, so not um, But um, I recently, um, I'm in. in a, in a Kuti Kuti collective that's uh, like 50 people collected from Helsinki. And we just recently made it uh, because we have our own art right in Finland. And actually, they take part in the government at the moment. So, so we're living the satire all the time. We're seeing it in the, in the, in the news all the time. So, we made a, just like recently, um, a newspaper of comics with the. Uh, uh, there's, this, there's this village. Like folklore stories based on this village called Hermela in Finland. That's kind of like the stories about people who try to find shortcut to any any everything. Uh, <laughs> so basically, like uh, we, we made up new stories of this Hermela and put these like people who run the, the nation at the moment in these stories. So this was just like two weeks ago. Yeah. Has, there, has the reaction been to it? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like. I mean, but it's, uh, of course, I mean, um, we, we should, like, uh, find ways how to reach this kind of, the normal people who actually vote for these people, or the alt-right. So it's, it's no use to, like, uh, talk to people who actually are the, share the same opinions you have. Mm. So, and that's why we made it as a free publication, so we took it into, like, cafes and uh, restaurants and barber shops and basically everywhere, so 14 cities. So you hope it raises some new ideas for right. these people. Right. Sam, so do you feel like this? Um, does your work deal with politics of the present? Mm. I mean, it's set in the past, but 
Yeah, I mean, not, I don't overtly go after things that are political, but I always try and have some sort of truth that I'm trying to get with or get to with my stuff. Like, um, I don't know. I don't really know how to articulate it well, but <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs> Now, has any one of you ever gotten, felt you, you'd done something that went too far, or was too, you know, something that, that, yeah, you just went too far with something? I mean, whether, in, it doesn't even have to be, like, offense, I mean, just in, you know, lost your way. Um, I did a personal comic once, and I never want to do that ever again. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, like, it's, I'm, I love reading that stuff, and I love reading people's stories, um, but trying to do it and, like, think about your own life and dwell on stuff that you maybe don't want to dwell on or thought was a mistake is not something I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, there's uh, many cartoonists who disagree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there, amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Aaron, do you do any autobiographical comics, or is it all? Uh, the last issue of my book trim is almost entirely autobiographical. Which is about art school. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, there were some, there were some pot shots at uh, my alma mater, Columbus yeah. College of Art and Design. Oh yeah. Um, Tommy, do you put, uh, is any of it, this? I mean, your your work is like. Uh, like you say, it really is like meaning of life stuff. It's very much about like you know how this life unfolds, I, I, and I mean there's dark humor along the way, definitely. But um, yeah, is it autobiographical? Even though you have like little cartoon dudes. Uh, I tried to do some, but it's like ten years ago. It didn't really work, so I never published it. Yeah, I mean in some way I put lots of my old thoughts, of course, inside. It's, it's kind of presenting my view on life in a way, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so, by the way, if anybody wants to ask questions, um, we have two microphones. We do ask that you use microphones at either side, um, so uh, you can line up there. Um, yeah, I mean, what, um, you know, what, what shocks you on the panel here? What do you find shocking? I, you know, I don't know if I should say this, but I get shocked whenever I go into a, a bathroom and the, the toilet papers run out and <laughs> somebody put the other roll of toilet paper right on top of it. <laughs> I find that to be shocking. I, I agree with that, actually. So. Yeah. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. Um, we kind of maybe already uh, addressed this, but like, um, so you're talking about satire and so on, not so much within comics, but like going back to the greats, like someone like George Carlin would basically say like, you know, you can joke about anything. It all depends on the construction of the joke. One, do you find that's the case in comics? Um, maybe elaborating more on about if you can ever go too far. And the last part, um, I'm asking if, um, where do you find the balance with humor and satire between entertaining, informing, and being an observer and like having a social responsibility in a sense where like really the balance between um, I'm doing this because it amuses me, I think it's going to amuse others, but I also have some kind of social responsibility that I want to get across to open people's minds about something that they may be um, uh, thought or like um, they'd be too embarrassed to talk about or to address within its, uh, maybe a group of, of people. If, if, if that made any sense. <laughs> yeah. I think it's how do you get an audience to, to think about the stuff that you're doing? Is that the question? Pretty much the, the, the balance between um, what you find amusing and funny and like the social responsibility of informing people and getting them to essentially like really just kind of putting their nose in it, like, you know, oh, we have this stuff going on in the world, but I'm going to show it to you in a way that's very shocking and get you to pay attention to get over all the white noise. Um, I think jokes can perform a social responsibility, and it's nice when they do, but I definitely think that you... No, you're not allowed to joke about just anything, you know? I think that... 
some things are inappropriate for some people to say, like, you know, you don't know what people's backgrounds are. It's like, there are ways to be funny, I think, and you can, you can make something that's sort of s simply funny, but also, like, gets at the heart of something and conveys some sort of message. Um, that's, that's a good aim, you know, but, yeah, I cut things out all the time because I'm like, I just don't feel right about saying it. You know, I have to take into account who I am and what I'm saying and, and who's, who's reading. Yeah. So you personally, you do believe there is a line between like, you know, we can't joke about this, before, maybe just you personally, correct? I think you can joke about whatever you want, but I think the debate is open and um, sometimes necessary about jokes, you know, and, and that needs to be like part of it. Like if you're going to put something out and then people are going to come for you, okay. then I think that's an opportunity for dialogue, you know, and if the joke got you there, then I think, yeah, maybe it was worth it. <laughs> so maybe like you can joke about anything, but it all depends on the intention and what, um, what what your end game is like I'm joking about this to get people to open their minds about something and punching up as opposed to you know making fun of someone who can't defend themselves in, in other words no yeah yeah <laughs> no no, I mean, no I'm just, yeah right but I mean I think you also need to stay in your lane you know not claim to have experiences you didn't have you know like continue learning from your mistakes that kind of thing mm -hmm. well I you know I mean as I was even putting out the slides I mean I think Aaron one of your you know most notorious ones was a strip called um, anorexic Jew <laughs> you know you say it was notorious I don't think I got any flack for that mm -hmm. but like you know uh, and, and you know no one complained mm -hmm. do you ever get complaints very rarely I, that, that was your first one. I'm sorry. I, 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 you know, I don't know. I, think, I don't think. Um, I mean, I'm not in the newspaper. I'm not on television. My books are. They're not. It's very easy to not read my books. It's the, the easiest thing you'll ever do. I mean, you have to like. My books are underground. You have to find them. So generally, the people that pick them up and read them kind of know what they're in for. And uh, I think it's you know people that are never quote unquote offensive and then they they slip up they're the ones that that get in trouble or people who get yelled at the most are like people that uh like oh like oh well how did why how did this white man dare to write uh a character that's a black lesbian and he's like that's not his experience like just like people yelling at people for writing fiction because it's like they're policing what they're allowed to say and i find people that don't People that quote unquote slip up are the ones that get yelled at because then there's like this aha moment. We, we've got you. Yeah. Another question over there? Um, I feel like we touched on this a little bit already, but I was just wondering if you have any advice for, you know, since we're living in an age where, you know, humor and, you know, Pepe the Frog, the frog like, can be co opted by, you know, the alt right to, to you know, make fun of us or make fun of like other people. How do you create satire that doesn't become fodder for who you're trying to make fun of, if that makes sense? I would say start with your truth. Because whatever you have, like if you have something you want to say or something you need to get out, you just need to start with that. And don't try and like cater it to anyone else or, you know, just do what you need to do. and you know, let the chips fall. Because like you were saying, like, you, you'll never know how people will react to it. And, um, you know, you can have the best intentions and suddenly it goes awry or, you know, somebody has a problem with it. And that can, like, open up dialogue. But as long as you're starting from, from yourself, I think, you know, it's all you can do, really, you know. Do any of you guys ever worry about being Peppy the Frog? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really is horrible what happened yeah. to, you know, I mean, Pepe the Frog was just like a stoner. I mean, he didn't do anything. You know, he had nothing to do with politics, really. And but I think that might be part of the reason why he was able to be co-opted, because it was such a, like, open character. Like, you know, I'm doing a comic about 
lesbian separatist witches, and I don't, I mean, who knows what could happen, like, you know, there's crazy stuff happening all the time, but um, I just don't see them being co-opted in the same way, I don't know, but I can knock on wood, I don't want that to happen. Question? Hi. I'm actually hesitant to even ask this. Um, I'm a centrist, so I observe, I think, the further you go in any direction, you find kind of extreme views on either side. Um, I'm curious if you guys would agree with me if I say that shock humor, farce, and satire are tools to be used against any mainstream view. And the further the pendulum swings in one direction or the other, you're going to have really hard pushes in the other direction. I'm wondering if the right and center jokes, like Pepe, alt-right, stuff like that, is just a response to let's say, left-leaning views becoming the new mainstream, and is there a danger that the alt-right is the new underground? I'm wondering what a panel like this might look like in, say, 10, 20 years. Are we going to have extremists, quote-unquote, in the other direction? It, some asshole said, I forget who it was, that alt-right is the new punk rock, and that's just, like, the biggest load of bullshit. I've ever heard in my life, you know, punk rock, people left the house and, you know, got laid and did drugs. It's all right. <laughs> Nerds live in their mother's basements and fuck around on the computer. So, no, it's not the new punk rock, and it's ridiculous. Uh, that's maybe not entirely answering your question, but I think it'll suffice. Yeah, but the mainstream does try to shock. I mean, that's why they're the mainstream. They're trying to get our attention. They want to cut things into blurbs. I mean, I, what I'm afraid of is having things that are nuanced and maybe do take some time to talk about, kind of like cut into bits and misquoted, you know, like that's a fear of mine. But the mainstream, I mean, pushes tons of lies, like lots of propaganda, you know, in terms of being shocked, like, Everybody's shocked right now with the political situation in this country, but all over the world. I mean, there have always been things to be shocked about, and I, it's the mainstream is shocking. I mean, in my my comics, for instance, are like soothing to me. Like maybe they look wild or something, but it's actually like an escape from from this constant barrage of propaganda and and telling me things that have shock value that I don't necessarily need to spend my time looking at. Also, I, I think the scale has been uh, loaded and we've lost sight of, uh, you know, what things mean. And like, in, I, maybe you could agree with this or disagree, but in like in Europe, someone like Bernie Sanders is not a radical, like that's a pretty average, the, Bernie Sanders politics are not radical far left politics. In other countries, those are very centrist average politics. And we lose sight of that because the conversation is so loaded and askew and the narrative has been stolen. Good question. I was just wondering if you had any uh, advice for people starting out when it comes to uh, coming up with a punchline or a visual gag and whether to push it and keep pushing it to see if you can get something really funny or a new punchline or to stick back with what you thought was funny. Pushing it how? To uh, either keep pushing it and see if you can get something else or stick with what you think would work but maybe other people would not get. Just Knowing the line where you push a punchline or a visual gag or stick back to what was working already. Yeah, I mean, comics are hard, I think, with humor because, like, a lot of comedy relies on timing, and you can't really... You can do that to some extent in comics, but you're also relying on the reader to follow through these certain panels. Um, I would say just experiment with what you think is good and you know show it to people and see what they think and gauge your reaction like if you want to push something more than do it um, I don't think there's any like hard and fast rules there's like one panel comics that are amazing and there's like things that are you know have a punchline at the end of like a 30 page story so yeah, you got so, just sorry uh, yeah so I think the main thing is that uh, you shouldn't really think that you should be funny. And because uh, I think uh, humor 
in my own work, I use it as a tool to like uh, give different perspective on some things I'm dealing with. So sometimes if I just show the like the plain action without any humor, it's, it becomes humor indeed. Or sometimes you need to be really stupid in a way, so or turn things up to, upside down. But, but the main thing is that you can give like a different perspective on on the thing with humor. So I think like the, the peanuts, for example, is an example of this. So. Yeah, it's the change in perspective, right? Like the, I mean, isn't that kind of the basis of humor? It's just the, the shift in the perspective. Or I think clarity is important. You know, you might have to fiddle with a joke because, yeah, it's one thing if you just want to think it's funny. That's great. You should do that, you know? But, I mean, also delivering jokes sometimes they get lost. Yeah, there's a matter of um, breaking it down. I always try to run things past people, see if they get it, if they think it's funny, you know, because it's easy to get lost reading comics, so clarity is is helpful. I think it would be like really horrible to wake up in the morning and think that today I, sh I should be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, I know those colleagues who make every, every day they make like one story, like five stories. So. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Anybody? Last question here. Sorry, you can't see me, but I'm in a wheelchair, <laughs> so, I can, so I can't really go down. Um, in regard to sentiment and kind of um, where we've kind of overall then talk about it in the current landscape as if it happened like yesterday. But have you found, or I guess what is your personal take on what satire is? Because more and more and more I feel like you kind of have, I don't want to say satire co-opted, but have a lot of people you know I don't say entirely what right does this, but say something extreme or maybe something, something messes up, and it's like, oh, it's satire and it's a joke. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm wondering if your experience of satire has changed or why that means to you because there is there is a certain responsibility to that you know yeah you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna cut off your question there because we are running short on time but i think it's a great question i think we yeah. don't can i still use something yeah yeah not just a joke so what is yeah what is your definition of satire what is everyone's personal definition of satire um three elements like irony Exaggeration and just being funny and clinical. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like uh, when you go to the park and you get a caricature done of yourself. Like, it's just exaggerating certain things that maybe like point out something. Uh, I think it was Neil Simon, and if I'm wrong, someone can correct me, but I believe he said that satire is what closes <laughs> eye-opening night, so I think that's a pretty good summation. Yeah. You know, I, I've heard that attributed to, like, George S. Kaufman, so, I mean, every generation yeah, could pushes fun. it back to, like, Oscar Wilde or something, but, yeah. There's no, there's no sign. Tom, satire? Uh, yeah, well, I think it's the definitions changing all the time. And it's kind of like difficult as an artist for an artist. I mean, lately, I, myself, I've been like, uh, I've been, because people who know my work know that I don't use any spe specific style indeed, so I don't do any style. Uh, so I've been like learning like really cute ways of drawing and telling stories about really horrible things with these new stars. So it's my new way of satire. Uh, I would say you have a very strong style, actually, but you draw in different different styles. So, um, oh, okay, all right. Well, um, <laughs> to wrap it up, then let's um, let's talk about uh, where people can find you here at the show, and also what is next for you, and what your hopes for the next you know the next part of your work is. 
Um, uh, sometime you alluded to some new stuff you're doing, but um, yeah, what's next for you, and where can we find you at the show? Uh, yeah, uh, here I've been singing at the Fabric Park Stable tomorrow, still but uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm working at the moment with the sort of like sort of science fiction book. Um, so I've been doing it for two years, and I should continue for three years still. So, but it's about. Uh, um, like alternative stories about the future of, of mankind. So it's, it's a big subject, again, so. but it's, it's actually really humorous. So let's see. Cool. Aaron? Hey, you uh, said so where we can yeah, find Yeah, where us. we can find you at the show and, and what's next for us. Sure, I'm at table E3, come on by. <laughs> and my comics are available from the Comics Company, that's comics with an X, a uh, little publisher out of Vancouver. Uh, right now, I am expanding on a comic I did to book length about the uh, Cleveland punk scene of the 1970s with an emphasis on the musician Peter Lochner, who is kind of the Robert Johnson of Midwestern punk rock, who recorded very, very little and uh, drank himself to death by the age of 24. So it's a real upbeat story. And talking to Hollywood, Hollywood was knocking, <laughs> a lot of money coming my way, beating the publishers off with a stick. So you'll see the billboards soon enough. It's good. Um, I'm at table F10 with Katie, my table mate. Um, I'm working on the next issue of Malefusium. I hope to have it done by cab next month, but um, if not, hopefully soon. Um, I just did a piece for, I think it's called Kush, the Latvian oh, anthology. Yeah, Kush, yeah. yeah. Um, and it was about a gay serial killer, and I had a lot of fun doing it, so I might do more of that, but we'll see. <laughs> Um, I'm at F10, like Sabin says. I have a zine. It's called Art Fan. It's pretty glossy and long, and it's um, a collection of four art shows that I went to and reviewed, and they're kind of trippy and weird, and they kind of preserve the experience of being at the shows, which are now gone. Um, so that's really cool. You should come by and get that. Um, I have my first cartoon in The New Yorker two days ago, one of the Daily Shouts. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, and so just look out for me. I'm around. I'm on Instagram at Cartoon Fricassee. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming. I think this is, you know, sometimes this is a... Um, as we've learned from all our questions, it's an interesting topic with many uh, questions and answers as well. So um, thank you all for coming. And Tommy, you had um, yeah, uh, a lot of copies of this uh, free paper. I did so. The first is yours. You can read it over All right. So you can read it over So you can actually read it. All right. Finish political comics also. It's, you get double your pleasure. So anyway, thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Sabin. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Heidi.